Welcome, everyone. Kim and I are very excited to have this opportunity to speak with you to help promote patency of our home care clients' central venous access devices so they can receive their infusion therapy as prescribed at the right time. As Kim and I are both on the board of directors, we have collaborated with the Canadian Vascular Access Association to provide this presentation to you. We will be introducing you to our organization, CEVA, and then we'll look at what the impact is when our patients see VADS block. Using the CVAA ONG guideline, which you'll learn about in a few minutes as a framework, we'll review the assessment, management, and prevention of occlusions. We'll also look at some implementation strategies that you and your organization may help find helpful to ensure that we keep our patients' lines open. The Canadian Vascular Access Association, or CEVA, is a national interdi interdisciplinary nonprofit organization. We're comprised primarily of nurses and pharmacists who are dedicated to advancing excellence in vascular access and infusion therapy. We have over 500 members across Canada, as well as members residing in the U.S. and Bermuda. In an effort to, to spread the word and actualize our vision of advancing excellence in infusion therapy and vascular access, when you join SIVA, you'll receive our peer-reviewed journal, and we encourage you to consider participating in our annual conference, which this year is in beautiful Vancouver, April 27th to 29th. We also encourage you to consider becoming certified so that you can have your expertise in infusion therapy and vascular access recognized. Now before we delve into uh, occlusions, we need to make sure that we're all familiar with the term CVAD. So a CVAD is a central venous access device, which is an intravenous catheter typically made of either polyurethane or silicone which provides direct venous access through a large lumen vein, usually directly to the superior vena cava. And because you have such tremendous blood flow in the superior vena cava, you've got, you maximize that hemodilution so that it does dilute our harsh vesicants and medication, medications, which could harm a smaller vein. Now, in an ideal world, our CVADs would all remain patent and flow nice and smoothly. However, we haven't achieved that lofty goal of zero occlusions. In fact, in the home care world, Moreau and colleagues in a study of over 50,000 home care patients in the U.S. found that a catheter occlusion are the most frequent CVAD complication in home care. So what do we mean by a catheter occlusion? I think most of us would recognize that a catheter that you can't infuse in or aspirate blood from is an occlusion. But we also need to know that if you meet resistance when you're flushing that catheter or you get sluggish blood return, that is considered a dysfunctional catheter, a type of catheter occlusion, and it must be treated. And sometimes we, we tend to think of a catheter occlusion as a, a benign event, but it really can have significant impact on our healthcare system, from the patient who may have an impact on his quality of life because of the interruptions in therapy, receiving their medications late, they may need catheter replacement, not to mention on the organization. So if we know what a, a burden it is to the nurse when she's unable to deliver the medication because the line is occluded. And then we may have to call the licensed prescriber to let them know we can't deliver the medication through that block line. We may have to call the hospital to coordinate an appointment to have them go in to have the line unblocked. We may have to call the pharmacy because we, we can't deliver it the way it was issued if we have changing um, to a peripheral vascular access device, etc. We may have to now draw blood instead of through the line. It may have to be drawn through the, um, through the peripheral vein. And of course, all of this has an impact on the healthcare system. It can increase the patient's risk, increase their length of stay as well. Of course, all of that has an impact on costs. And ultimately, it drives down quality care. 
So in Nancy Moreau's study, which I just mentioned, she delved further and she actually looked at what the impact is of an occlusion on the home care patient. And 43% of these 53,000 patients, 43% of those who did have complications experienced an interruption in therapy because of the loss of patency. 29% had to have their catheter replaced. And we know the stress and potential trauma related to that. 14% had to have their catheter removed. And 15% had to go through the inconvenience, the expense, the risk, the stress of either an eMERGE visit or an unscheduled hospital visit. So catheter occlusions are a very real problem in the home care setting. And compounding this has been the lack of evidence and standardized recommendations for the safe and effective management of catheter occlusions for our Canadian patients. So recognizing the, the risks with catheter occlusions and the impact on the client, um, the nurse, and the healthcare system, um, SIVA decided, in collaboration with our membership, um, to create an occlusion management guideline for, uh, for CVADs. We do refer to this as the OMG. Um, the, the purpose of doing this is really to uh, standardize you know, practice and provide evidence um, related to the management and prevention and assessment of, of catheter occlusions um, all in one place in a Canadian um, resource. So the objectives of, of the OMG were to provide practice recommendations based on published evidence and consensus of clinical expertise, to provide practical clinical resource tools to support implementation of the recommendations, to decrease variation in practice and enhance patient outcomes, um, recognizing, of course, that the guideline does not replace critical thinking and professional judgment. The guideline is available um, in hard copy and on the SEVA website. You do not need to be a member to, in order to download the OMG. Um, it is available to the public. The, the main work of the OMG is divided into um, five, five main sections. So assessment, um, mechanical occlusions, thrombotic occlusions, chemical occlusions, and prevention of CVAD occlusions. Um, we certainly used um, a, a credible um, um, guideline for grading our recommendations. Um, we graded them both on strength of recommendation as well as level of ed evidence. And it's all very um, transparent throughout the guideline. So our plan today um, with you is to really go through the OMG, starting um, just a bit with the background and then going through um, mechanical thrombotic and chemical occlusions, and then uh, prevention. So to give a little bit of background or to share a little bit of the background that's written um, within the OMG, we talk about the types of occlusions. Um, so the first type of occlusion is a partial occlusion. And this is what Daphne was referring to earlier when she was speaking to those lines where it's a little bit sluggish or it's a little bit harder to um, flush in fluid or aspirate blood. Um, the second type of occlusion is withdrawal occlusion. This is where you have sluggish or absent blood return. However, the line flushes without resistance. And the third type of occlusion is a complete occlusion. So this is an inability to infuse, um, infuse fluid or aspirate blood. It's very important that you know the difference between the types of occlusions and that you're able to recognize what type of occlusion your client is experiencing. It gives us really big clues as to what's causing the occlusion. So three different things can cause a catheter occlusion. Um, mechanical occlusions, chemical occlusions, and thrombotic occlusions. So we know that about 25 to 36% of all um, CVADs experience one of these three types of catheter occlusions. Thrombotic occlusions are by far the um, most popular, with about 50%, 58% of all catheter occlusions being thrombotic. The remaining 42% are either mechanical or chemical. So now that we know what the types uh, and causes of occlusions are, let's go through how we can actually assess our catheter to make sure it's working properly, and if it's not, what's going on? So we know that 
All of the best practice guidelines recommend that we must always assess the patency of our catheter before using the catheter. So how do we do that? You're going to flush the catheter, the lumen, each lumen, with saline and attempt to aspirate blood from the lumen. And when you're doing that, you want to see how easily you can flush through and how promptly you get that blood return. Again, as we've been emphasizing, it doesn't have to be occluded fully to be considered occlusion, even if a partial or withdrawal occlusion is in fact an occlusion that needs to be treated. So how do we know? What are the signs of a catheter occlusion? Again, it's resistance when you're flushing, that sluggish flow, or maybe you can't infuse at all. It could be that you're getting frequent alarms on your pump saying downstream occlusion or high pressure. And what some don't realize is that actually if you have infiltration or extravasation or swelling or leakage at the CVAT site, those can actually be signs as well or perhaps even consequences of a catheter occlusion. So once you've assessed that catheter, of course, as uh, any nursing procedure, we have to document the assessment and the signs and symptoms that we have observed. And then we must promptly investigate. We cannot leave that dysfunctional lumen without treating it. So let's say that we do have a, an occluded catheter. The first thing we're going to look at is, is there a problem with the catheter system, which we tend to call a mechanical occlusion. So you're going to look and see, look to the administration set and see if there's any signs. And Kim, I'm going to actually just get you to just advance to the next slide. So look to the administration set and see if there's any kinks or are the, are the clamps closed. If there's a filter on the set, it could be that that filter has become clogged. Is the tubing kinked or twisted? Are the flow rates exceeding the, the maximum flow rates of the vascular access device? Although that tends to be less, less common, but may happen perhaps with PICS. Do you have a tight connection between the administration set or any add-on device and the catheter? Or is it a little bit loose? You also want to look to signs of the, the administration set causing the occlusion, maybe it's related to the catheter. And so, of course, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look at the catheter site. If there's clamps on the catheter, check to make sure that they are unclamped. Is that catheter kinked? Our, our, especially our picks are such a fine diameter. If that catheter is twisted, that can cause an occlusion. And you may need to change that dressing and make sure that the catheter is lying straight on the skin with no kinks or twists. You may also want to consider changing the extension set. Or maybe it's the needless connector that's on the end of the cap. If the client has an implanted port, it could be that that gripper has not properly cored. And I'll speak to that in just a moment. Now, we know that the tip of the catheter should be sitting midline in the vein. It is possible that that tip does move within the vein. And sometimes it, it might be possible that the tip is lying against the vessel wall. And that's where we ask our patient then to raise their arm, roll their shoulder forward, turn over on their side, sit up, lie down, just change their position, uh, to take a deep breath, cough, and that may move the tip of the catheter off the vessel wall. You, it, there may be times, though, where you've ruled out all of this and maybe you've, you've tried, the patient has been sent into the hospital to try instilling a medication in the catheter to dissolve a thrombotic occlusion and it doesn't resolve that. The patient may need a chest x-ray and it could be that that tip of the catheter that should be sitting right at the entrance to the heart in the distal SVC, it may have dislodged, it may be migrated to a smaller vessel that may be causing that occlusion and therefore a chest x-ray may need to be ordered. So when we look at implanted ports, we know that the, the catheter that is attached to the, the um, chamber of the port should be tunneled under the skin and then entering into the vein down to the superior vena cava. However, if you look at this image on the left. What's happening here is this is a patient who went for fluoroscopy and in the center of the port there's a white line and that's actually the Huber needle that has accessed the needle so that you can infuse through it. 
and they've injected dye, and dye appears white, and we should be seeing that dye advancing through the catheter. But what's happening where the arrow is, you can see the dye actually in the subcutaneous tissue, and this is because that Huber needle that should be nicely centered, coring the chamber of the port, did not core the septum, and now that needle is actually dumping the, the solution out into the subcutaneous tissue, so it's not even entering into the venous system. The image on the right, the catheter has actually fully retracted out from under the skin, or excuse me, out from the vein, but is under the skin in the subcutaneous tissue. So for both of these situations, you would not obtain blood return. You may be able to infuse, but you will not get blood return, and this is why it's so very important that we assess for blood return when we're assessing for catheter patency. Now, if your patient has a tunnel catheter that's been inserted into the subclavian vein, so this may be an implanted port or your tunnel catheter such as a Hickman catheter, if the catheter is inserted too closely into the vein, as we can see in the diagram in the top left, too close to the clavicle and the rib, that clavicle and rib can act like scissors and they'll pinch off the vein where the catheter is. And, over, and that you may not notice any symptoms at first, but over time, that wear and tear of the friction of the clavicle and the rib can actually cause a hole in the catheter, or may actually, even as you can see in the image below, it may sever the catheter. And so if this happens, let's say you did get a hole in the catheter, rather than having our medication dumping into the superior vena cava in the heart with all that tremendous blood flow, you then would have the medication exiting the hole, so then that medication is entering the subcutaneous tissue, and it's particularly if it's a vesicant, such as many of our oncology agents, it can cause extensive extravasation, as you can see in the images on the right. The, the um, fluoroscopy x-ray images in the center, the top image actually shows the catheter where it's kinked because of the clavicle and the rib pressing the catheter. And the diagram, the x-ray below actually shows where the catheter has completely severed. And if you look down along the spinal column, you can see a white line, and that is actually the distal portion of the implanted port severed off completely and has advanced into the the uh, left side of the heart. So if your patient has one of a, a tunnel catheter, and for instance, you can only get blood return if they raise their arm or roll their shoulder forward, those are potential, those are red flags that may indicate a, a pinch off syndrome, and therefore a chest x-ray should be ordered. It should be noted that a pick will not exhibit or will not cause pinch off because it is not inserted into the subclavian vein, picks of are of course inserted into our peripheral veins in the arm. A Health Canada alert was issued in 2011 to caution clinicians to be aware of the risk of pinch off. And I think we've covered all of those most uh, um, other signs of a mechanical occlusion. So if it's not a mechanical occlusion, then we know, as Kim said, statistically, it likely is due to what's called a thrombotic occlusion. So what is a thrombus? Well, we know that as soon as we put these catheters into our patient's bloodstream, the body tries to protect itself from these devices by coating them with blood and proteins. And that can build up over time. So it may build up on the inside of the catheter, and that's what we call an intraluminal thrombotic occlusion. And that thrombus may be partial, like we see on that image, or it can build up over time and cause a complete occlusion. So with that image up on the left for intraluminal, that's where you may meet some resistance when you're flushing, because it's not flowing in through a nice open patent vessel. Or you may get resistance when you're drawing blood back, depending on how much of a buildup is inside that catheter. Then we have the fibrin tail and this is where you have that fibrin extending from the end of the catheter 
And when you infuse, you can infuse fine, but when you go to aspirate, that negative pressure of pulling back on the plunger causes that tail to flap over the end of the catheter and therefore you don't get blood return. Now that fibrin may be on the outside of the catheter and that's called a fibrin sheath. And I'm going to get into a little bit more detail on the risk of a fibrin sheath in just a few moments. You can also have, of course, the mural thrombus, or DVTs, where you get the blood and the platelets forming on the outside of the catheter and adhering to the vein wall. And the problem is when we have these thrombuses, you have these platelets and red blood cells that are, and fibrin, and this fibrin actually acts, they're like threads that cause a web trapping all these blood cells causing that thrombus to form. Now, if we have a fibrin sheath, that sheath may be just on the end of the catheter, which may cause perhaps some sluggishness when you're infusing or aspirating, but if that fibrin sheath is a much longer sock, what happens is the infusit comes down our catheter, as we can see in, this, in the image, and it should then dump out the end of the catheter and into our bloodstream. But if you have that fibrous sock over the end of the catheter, that solution comes down and then it gets trapped. So then it goes back outside the catheter, but it's trapped between the sheath and the outer wall of the catheter. And so then, however long that sheath is, that medication then may backtrack and dump out into a much smaller vein, or as on the image here, this is a full-length fibrin sheath where the medication is actually dumping out into the tissue where the catheter exits the skin. And if this is a vesicant, it can cause, or cause blistering or extensive damage of the skin, and that's what we know as extravasation. So this is the risk of using a catheter that does not infuse, that you cannot infuse freely or get blood return from. It could potentially cause infiltration and extravasation. So we must have that blood return. So you've ruled out the signs of a excuse me, of a mechanical occlusion. Now, what's going to cue you that maybe it is a thrombus occlusion? First thing. If you see blood in either the catheter or in the needless connector or the administration set, any part of that catheter system, then that may be a clue that you do have a thrombus. Now, one little tip for you when you're trying to, to aspirate, if you're meeting some resistance or if you can infuse but you're not getting blood return, it could be that you have fibrin on the end of the catheter. So this approach that I'm going to mention was actually proven in a research study whereby the nurses simply attach their saline syringe onto the end of the, the catheter and then you do a gentle push-pull. So you're pushing gently on the catheter, never pushing hard against resistance because you may cause a hole or cause further damage to the catheter. So gently push on the end of the plunger aspirate back a little bit, push a little bit more, pull back a little bit, and do that push-pull motion. And that may move the catheter tip off the end of the catheter so that you can infuse and get your blood return. If, however, you're just not able to get blood return but you can infuse, you may then want to pull out a 3 ml syringe, attach it to the catheter, and then aspirate back. Because with a 3 ml syringe, it actually creates less pressure when you're aspirating. So you may then be able to get blood return. Of course, we never use a 3 ml syringe to instill any solution. So you never would push on a 3 ml syringe to instill the solution because it may cause too much pressure and cause damage to the catheter. So if you're unable to restore patency, then you're going to suspect that there is a, th a thrombotic occlusion. Currently, there's only one agent on the market that is approved to dissolve these thrombuses, and that is called Alteplase, or Cathlo as we know. Now, the problem with this agent is it is not available in Ontario 
to our home care nurses because it is not on the OGB drug formulary. This is the only reason that we don't have our home care nurses declotting in the home is we can't access that drug unless the patient is going to self-pay. Now there is some very exciting work going on by uh, Debbie Salant and her team on Manitoulin Island where because they're a First Nations community, they've been able to get funding for that drug. So it's going to be very interesting to see the outcomes uh, of their um, program where they are now managing thrombotic occlusions. So presently for home care, if you have a, a, a patient who you suspect a thrombotic occlusion, we really have no choice but to contact the vascular access team or the um, most responsible physician to have cath flow or alteplase instilled in the hospital setting to break down that fibrin. Now we do in many areas. Uh, we're now starting to see clients who go into the hospital to have that cath flow instilled, but rather than staying in the hospital setting and then the patients are being transferred or sent back home and with the cath flow or the altar place dwelling inside the catheter and home care orders are written for the home care nurse to aspirate the catheter the next morning, withdraw that all to place, discard that syringe, then aspirate up to five mils of blood, and then flush the catheter with 20 mils of saline. And then the patient can then go on and receive their therapy. So we're starting to see more and more of that um, uh, responsibility for the home care nurse. And then, of course, if there is no resolution, the client would then have to, um, you'd have to reach the the vascular access team or the hospital to consider further treatment. So we've mentioned how to assess for a chemical, excuse me, for a mechanical occlusion and if it's not a mechanical occlusion then it could be a thrombus and more likely that's what it is. But there is the, the very occasional time that you may have a chemical occlusion. And what we mean by a chemical occlusion is where you have drug precipitates within the catheter. So you have two drugs which have come into contact within that catheter that are incompatible or it could be that a medication was diluted at the inappropriate concentration and that can cause precipitation. And then these drugs that are in the liquid state turn to a concrete and it literally looks like a white concrete within the catheter. And so that may cause a sluggish flow, so a partial occlusion depending on how much of a buildup there is or it can cause a complete occlusion. Now, we do know that sometimes TPN can cause chemical occlusions, particularly um, if the calcium phosphate ratio isn't correct, but now with, with the um, compounding process, that tends to happen less commonly. Lipids can also build up within the inside of that catheter and leave a waxy residue on the inside of the catheter. Some of the medications that are more common to cause chemical occlusions, well, the worst one is uh, dilantin, which unfortunately we don't see much in the hospital, but heparin is actually incompatible with many medications and that's why it's imperative that we always flush after heparin, either aspirate the, the uh, heparin or flush the, the heparin through so that you don't have heparin coming into contact with other medications such as meropenem or morphine or erythromycin or codeine because the heparin is incompatible with those medications. Now, we in the community do not tend to manage chemical occlusions and actually even in the hospital setting it doesn't occur as commonly although now that the occlusion management guidelines have this recommendation hopefully we'll start to see more um, treatment of this these uh, chemical occlusions and so again we don't have access to the hydrochloric acid or the sodium bicarb that are used to treat these acidic and alkaline drugs, but just you, you do need to be aware that it is possible for these catheters to be uh, treated and restore patency if there is a, a suspected chemical occlusion. So the next part of, of the OMG speaks to uh, prevention of, of CVAD occlusion. Um, and certainly our, our recommendations include um, ensuring that you have ongoing education and competency. Literature is evolving and um, there's new literature published every single day. Ensuring that you are up to date and your practice is up to date um, is critical. We, we learn 
phenomenal new things every single day. It is extremely important that we flush our lines and that we flush them properly. Um, fluid lock CVADs with non-valve technology when not in use and that we use um, proper clamping sequence. We need to prevent reflux of blood into the CVAD. Um, certainly this can be done using um, positive pressure or, or with um, certain technology that's available in our, in our injection caps. So we need to consider use of technology designed to prevent CVAD occlusions. And we need to routinely assess cath catheter patency. So um, every time you're accessing the catheter, checking for a blood return and intervening at the earliest signs of occlusions. We're not waiting until there's a, a total occlusion. Um, if you have even a sluggish line, that's a clue and that's a hint that something is wrong with that line and intervention is required. It's a lot easier to resolve an occlusion um, at, at an earlier onset versus when the line is completely occluded. When SIVA developed the OMG, we worked quite extensively um, to ensure that organizations had tools to help implement these recommendations. So you can go on our website, SIVA.info, and we have all these, these tools available for you and your organizations. There's an occlusion management algorithm for the hospital setting. We do have pre-printed orders and medical directives for the administration of the thrombolytic agent, the Altaplace. We also have competency skill checklists um, related to the uh, use of the thrombolytic agent. We have patient information. There is a, a video on the assessment of catheter, catheters that is a great teaching tool. We also have audit tools. Now, we uh, so if you go to it, this is a snapshot of our screenshot of our website. And if you go into the education portal, which you can see at the tab on the top right menu, we do have online learning resources. And that's where you can find the video, for instance. And we have an education portal. Kim, if you could advance one more, please. Um, sorry, I thought there was more. We do have a, an education uh, portal that we do um, provide tools to such as PowerPoint presentations, uh, literature search uh, questions, and a quiz. Now, in addition to those tools, actually Kim and her team have developed uh, phenomenal tools that are really useful for the uh, home care nurse. Now, you can see on the screen on the left, this is a tool that they developed because they found that they would send a patient, for instance, to the hospital to have a thrombotic occlusion assessed. And the, the, the patient would arrive in the, in the hospital setting and, and it would just be a withdrawal occlusion. The doctor would say, oh, that's fine. Go, you can at least infuse. Go ahead and use it. So the, actually, this is the form in the middle. So they developed this in, so that the patient can bring this into the clinic really more to heighten awareness of the risks of a withdrawal occlusion and why we don't use lines that have withdrawal occlusion. There's also on the left the patient information sheet for the patients to help them to understand the uh, what is going on with the withdrawal occlusion and what the risks are. The tool on the right is a tool that I developed. It was published in the SIVA's journal. It's a, a peer-reviewed tool and it's, you, it's designed to help the home care nurse to under, or to uh, provide strategies for the more common uh, complications related to CVADs. And the three arms on the left of this algorithm deal with withdrawal occlusion and, and complete occlusion and guiding the clinician on how to deal with this. So for instance, if it's a Friday afternoon and you're not able to reach that reach the physician and you do have a line withdraw with withdrawal occlusion, essentially you have three options. You can stop the infusion so that you minimize that risk of potential extravasation. And then, of course, you have to discuss the risks and benefits of that with the resident. Or you can consider uh, discussing with the, the client that you're going to start a peripheral IV and what are the risks and benefits and how do they monitor for signs of extravasation if they're doing that. The third option, and these are all the arms that are in the, the yellow boxes, the third option um, is a bit controversial, and that's where you continue the therapy, and that's supported in the RNAO best practice guidelines, particularly in the setting where you have a palliative care patient who is receiving um, 
analgesia. And if you stop the infusion, it could potentially send the patient into a pain crisis. So in that circumstance, you may decide that the risk outweighs, or excuse me, the benefit of continuing with therapy outweighs the risk of extravasation. So that tool is available through SIVA, or you can reach out to uh, through uh, SIVA, and we'll send it to you. And this is just a snapshot again of the education portal that I had just mentioned and some of the tools that are available. So on behalf of SIVA, Kim and I are, are thrilled to have partnered with RNAO and Schnig to bring you this opportunity to heighten awareness of the issue of catheter occlusion. And hopefully now you have some tools to help better assess our clients' CVADs to keep them patent and promptly recognize when a line is dysfunctional, what's causing it, and how to manage it. Please go onto the website, share the OMG and the related tools with your teams and organizations as we all strive to keep our patients' lines open. Thank you.